From the Radio Cafe and the Kivira Coalition, you're listening to Down to Earth, the Planet to Plate podcast. I'm your host, Mary Charlotte Domandi. Today we're going to be talking about how to restore not just a few acres, but an entire landscape, and what kind of collaboration it takes to do that. That's right after these brief announcements. This program is sponsored by the Agrarian Trust. Agrarian Trust is charting a new path forward for the land trust movement. They're advancing an innovative and robust model of land ownership in which agrarianism, social and environmental justice, community well-being, and the earth itself are all seen as fundamentally intertwined. They're doing this by helping regenerative farmers and ranchers to secure long-term affordable leases. That helps to strengthen local food systems and to transform community relationships to the land across the country. Visit agrariantrust.org to learn more. This program is sponsored by the Greenhorns. Listeners to Down to Earth might enjoy the newly released sixth edition of the New Farmer's Almanac, a literary miscellany written by and for working agrarians. This year's volume is titled Adjustments and Accommodations, and it's full of essays, poetry, and images that explore how people are facing challenges and uncertainties on the land. Learn more and order your copy at greenhorns.org. I'm very happy to welcome Jan Willem Janssens. He's founder of Ecotone Landscape Planning here in Santa Fe, New Mexico. Welcome to Down to Earth. Thank you, Mary Charlotte. I'm glad to be here. Great to have you. You're doing incredible work. We're talking about landscape level ecological restoration, which you're doing here in northern New Mexico. You are the director of Ecotone. What does the word Ecotone mean and what do you actually do? Yeah, so Ecotone is a small consulting firm here in Santa Fe. I'm the owner and principal. Ecotone, as a term, means the transition zone in a landscape, the transition between lower and higher, wetter and drier. So now Ecotone is, as a consulting firm, looking at management planning and implementation planning of land. We're planning and designing with natural processes and people, connecting people to the land and trying to cultivate stewardship among people for the long-term, careful and knowledgeable care and, and restoration of land. And not land as a picture, but land in all its processes. And so as a living entity. You're doing landscape scale restoration. What do we mean by landscape? So, yeah, what I mean with landscape is a larger area that forms and feels like an ecological whole. People know somewhat intuitively that a pinon juniper savanna is a different landscape than a ponderosa pine forest or an alpine meadow or the river delta of the Rio Grande right? Those are different landscapes. But when we talk about landscape scale planning, in a way, we're talking about differentiating it from smaller kind of patchwork projects. Exactly. And so many projects are several acres or maybe a couple of hundred acres in size. The landscapes that through my work I'm addressing are tens of thousands or hundreds of thousands, sometimes millions of acres. And when you talk about landscape at that scale, you're talking about land, water, trees, wildlife, human communities, agriculture, all of those things together. Exactly. So we're talking about the integration, actually, we're looking at how all these different elements that you mentioned relate to each other. And when you talk about doing landscape restoration on a landscape scale in northern New Mexico, what you're talking about is that there have been places, that there are places that have been quite badly degraded over the last couple of hundred years. What does that look like? So what we're seeing is that certain areas particularly have degraded because they've lost their topsoil. And with that topsoil, the, the sponge that that soil is to hold water. And also, it's not just a sponge like we have in the sink. It is a sponge that actually has a lot of biological life, microbes, fungi, little animals. And they work together with the roots 
the water that's in the soil to create a chemical soup, you could almost say, that helps plants to grow because they break minerals down, they break humus further down and all the plant litter that is really important for the nutrients that plants need to grow. And that life that's in the soil is also depleting all over the place. So through my work in Ecotone, I'm looking at restoring soils as living organisms and as sponges of water, healthy wetlands and healthy watersheds that have that healthy soil, and healthy forests that have that healthy soil that support the communities downstream. So what is at stake? I mean, we have a landscape that is way out of balance in many of the ways you've just described. What is at stake for communities, for people, if this imbalance is not addressed and remediated? In other words, if these landscapes aren't restored? So I think that the greatest impact on the livelihoods of people is that over the last several hundred years, we've really lost the soil that is the growing medium for native plants or agricultural crops wherever we have an agricultural area or rangelands for productive grass. And so with that soil sponge being lost, the landscape is much more likely to dry out because it cannot hold as much water. The water runs off more quickly, concentrates then in lower places, causing erosion. And so this entire cycle of degradation of land and soil loss has gradually picked up more and more steam over the last couple of hundred years. Because like the less soil you have, the faster water runs down Correct. instead of being absorbed, and that just continues the vicious cycle. That's right. Yeah. So you are taking on this incredibly daunting task of restoring these landscapes. I mean, it's impressive and sort of almost unimaginable, but I mean, how do you restore soil over such a large area? I know there are certain soil health principles what are they and how are you using them in these big areas? So I think it's important to, to say first that you, as you mentioned me, is not just me. I work in and with networks of people and I do that on purpose. And so I am part of a large network of networks of soil health stewards and, and champions, of conservation champions, of foresters, of watershed restoration professionals. And there is a growing awareness, I think, in the last decade that we need to start looking at larger landscapes, at watershed scales, at entire forest ecosystems to be more effective in the face of climate change and the extinction we're dreading right now that is threatening our livelihoods and our landscapes. I've always had a holistic, integrated perspective on planning. And through my parents' interest in or profession in geography and, and geophysics, I was brought up with the idea that yeah, the landscape is this very large, complex set of geophysical and biological and human activities that interact with each other. As a kid of three, four, five, we had these conversations around the table. So that actually spurred me, I think, to study landscape architecture and all the interactions that are happening in the landscape. And I brought that to the United States when I came here 30 years ago and always tried to add this larger integrated perspective to what I did and always tried to ask why and where and how things happened historically and in terms of cause-effect relationships across the landscape. Restoration for me doesn't mean that we go back to one particular time in the past because over time the landscape evolved and was shifting. And so it's really important to understand what the natural processes are, and that restoration often means that we need to restore natural functions of ecosystems, of fire, of soil regeneration. 
I love the idea that you're not restoring to a single time and place, but you're restoring to the processes of the natural systems. And then once those are restored, the landscape will restore itself to whatever the conditions are now. Exactly. And I can give examples of that. So I've been working for many years in various places where the erosion control work that we did across hundreds of acres have gradually accumulated sediment behind hundreds of structures that were built. Small rock or wood structures that were harvested locally, they often don't have to be big, but it's the cumulative effect of many of them that accumulates sediment behind them and that then helps spread the water. And then that water starts flowing again, maybe for the first time in decades, over open grassland or woodland, re-irrigating those areas. And then you see after a good summer or fall that plants start to rebound. Now, these are incredibly low-tech things that people do. You place a rock, you place a log or a a cut branch or something like that on the ground. They are very low-tech. Actually, they are very much inspired by what native people used to do, either here or in Mexico. And they have been documented by various people like Bill Zedek, a teacher of many of us here in northern New Mexico, but many other people too. And we've learned from native people over time as well. And so taking these techniques that are very sophisticated but simple structures of rock that hold the level of the soil, that accumulate soil behind it, that slow and spread the water, those are the techniques that actually are very helpful in these landscapes. And what you see then is that water infiltrates, spreads, gullies heal and fill up, and the landscape once again starts to have and grow the soil sponge that is so important for the regeneration of natural plant material that then again provides habitat for wildlife. And downstream, provides more gentle flows of water, not flash flooding, so that the farms have a gentler flow in their acequias, which is benefiting enormous amounts of people. And just for our listeners who may not know, acequias are the traditional irrigation dishes that they use here in northern New Mexico and also in Spain and some other countries as well. Correct, yes. Mm -hmm. So when you use these techniques of placing rocks and wood and and structures on the ground to slow the water, and the soil builds, what is it building from? What are the materials that go into making the soil under those circumstances? Ah, Thank you for that question. That's a great one. So how that works is that you first get material that's eroded from upstream. When you say material, what do you mean? Rocks? Sand, Sand. gravel, very fine particles of, of mineral. And they also include particles of organic matter, little broken down sticks, needles, leaves, twigs. So what happens then is that you gradually build up that soil of that mineral material that has washed down from somewhere else and that is mixed with some organic matter that's already in the soil. And because water infiltrates more readily into that sediment material, it stays a little longer. And because seeds, many native seeds, are still in the landscape, they then can sprout. And then when plants break down and when the roots break down as a result of microbes that are in the soil, you grow that organic matter in the soil that we often call humus. And so that becomes food for other microbes in the soil and you start building a living soil in what used to be a depleted mineral soil. So basically, these the sort of sand and minerals get mixed with plants that grow roots. And then when all of that breaks down, the combination of the sand and the, the roots and the plant material, as it decomposes, creates soil. That's right. And it, it, it is mostly the decomposition of the root material and the organic matter that's in the soil itself. I'm struck by the process and the fact that it is a slow process. It's a process of, what, years? Like when when you have an area that you and your network have successfully restored to where there is a good living soil, how long does that take? It takes years to decades. Sometimes you hear that it takes thousands of years, but that's not entirely 
correct. I think in, in thinking in decades is the right way to go about expecting soil health to develop. We have discovered that actually by purposefully putting mulch down, plant litter material, branches, needles, whatever you harvest on the land, then you create a microclimate, you get more infiltration of water, the evaporation loss is less, and grasses will grow in between. So you get actually a process of kickstarting of natural regeneration, create that initial skin, almost like a little band-aid that covers the wound that is so in so many places in place in the soil. And so then natural processes start to happen to regrow the plant cover. You've been at this long enough that you've seen that process come to a point of real soil health in those landscapes. That's right. So I've experienced that both in, in grasslands, where I've done a lot of this kind of work in pinon juniper, savannas and woodlands, in now ponderosa pine forests, where after the Hermit's Peak Calf Canyon fire, the Forest Service can no longer and does not want no longer to have many pile burns. So there are certain ranger districts now where they're looking at a more diverse use of the slash, that is the thinning material from trees, so that actually that slash is not only pile burned, but that it actually is spread over the surface of the forest floor so that it creates that microclimate and that we also use it in small structures for erosion control in drainages so that all these gullies in the forest gradually heal. It might take a couple of years, but then actually more moisture will stay in the forest, more undergrowth will regenerate. That has, on the one hand, a positive effect to retaining more moisture and restoring a more diverse ecosystem. On the other hand, some people are concerned that that creates more fine fuels in the forest. Well, that is so, but in many forests, we need actually that natural fire cycle back. Near towns, villages, we may not want that, so then we need to figure out other strategies how to deal with that or protect the residential homes. But in many parts of the forest, actually low intensity, low severity or mixed severity fires are good to thin out the forest so that a natural fire doesn't take out hundreds of thousands of acres with intensities that remove the potential for this forest to restore itself in the next hundred years. I mean, a lot of people don't understand that it's possible to have too many trees in the forest, considering, I mean, the argument is, well, trees photosynthesize and they provide habitat and so on. But when you have a system of fire suppression, as we've had for many, many decades, you do have this overgrowth of trees. Explain that cycle to us. So most landscapes in New Mexico, most forests particularly, are fire dependent. So fire is part of the processes of, you could say, recycling of the life in the forest. And so forests grow back, grow old and decay largely thanks to fire. If we don't have fire in our forests, we remove basically a factor for these forests, including their soils, to rejuvenate. Because the fire, you could say, thins out the forest and makes it open. Many of our forests most likely were relatively open park landscapes with clumps of ponderosa pines then with open areas of grass, with maybe here and there a large older tree, but also with a lot of grass supporting elk, deer, and lots of other animals. And so it was much more of a mosaic. And then fire would come through, often set by lightning or sometimes by native people in the past, that would clean out the underbrush, clean out young trees, that would prevent actually these forests to grow very dense Because what happens then is that there is no light anymore for any form of undergrowth. So you have a lot of thin, spindly trees that grow underneath taller trees. What happens then is that all these smaller trees particularly compete with each other for light and nutrients and moisture. And if a fire comes through, these smaller trees are basically burning up more quickly because they're more stressed and that the flames reach the taller trees so that the fire reaches the canopies, then these trees explode in 
balls of fire. So basically, then you get a crown fire that, driven by wind, can impact tens of thousands of acres per day. And that is not a normal pattern. That is not what fire ecologists have seen happening so often in the past several hundred years. So now, for those of us who might go up hiking in the forests in this area, what we're seeing is often a lot more thickly grown than we might have seen in the natural forest ecosystem some hundreds of years ago. That is what we're deducing right now from all the historical information that is being stacked together. That's right. Yeah. Yeah. You're listening to Down to Earth. We're going to take a quick break. We'll be right back. We're in a new chapter of conservation. In the first chapter of conservation in this country, you had wilderness and then you had city. But today, more and more, we understand that there's this very important piece in the middle that we call the working landscape. That is Leslie Allison, the executive director of the Western Landowners Alliance. These are the places that provide our food, our fiber. They provide the jobs that sustain the rural communities. These things are incredibly important and they're disappearing. And that's really our next challenge going forward. We have to think beyond protected wilderness. And you can't do that unless you're engaging the people in those landscapes, first and foremost, in that solution. Led by the people on the ground, Western Landowners Alliance advances policies and practices that sustain working lands, connected landscapes, and native species. What we're seeing in the West today is incredibly hopeful because you do see collaborations, working with partners, trying to realize this vision that's so important to us. I think many places in the rural West are actually leading the way on this. And so can you. Join us and learn more at westernlandowners.org. And now back to our program. Let's talk for a moment about, I want to get back to fire, but let's talk for a moment about water. One of the things that I'm learning through learning about the kind of work you're doing and restoration in general is that, I mean, people think water is a fixed quantity. You get a certain amount of rain and snow per year, and that's what you have. But it's not just about how much precipitation falls from the sky. It's what happens to it when it hits the ground or hits the trees. That water can go away or it can really be used in the landscape. Absolutely. So it's really important uh, at this time with our current knowledge of the history and where we've come with the degradation that has happened and what we're now knowing about forecasts of climate that we're really critical about how we're conserving water in the landscape. And so people have heard a lot about how you do that in your backyard. But the knowledge how to do this at a landscape scale is still pretty much in a research phase. Now, in the backyard, it might consist of using mulch and sort of terraforming your yard so that water flows in certain patterns. Exactly. And so many people who have yards have now been learning a little bit about how to make the water from the sky or that falls that you collect from your roof more effective so that it stays in the soil and you can still have some vegetation around your home. Now, we need to get those principles applied across the landscape. And so what I want to mention first is what I think I contribute to a lot of the work here uh, for which there is really a need and, and funding is to add landscape scale management plans. So in the late 1990s, uh, the state of New Mexico and the Federal Natural Resources Conservation Service got together to launch watershed-based planning throughout the state of New Mexico. So we have now a history of 25 years of watershed planning. Before that, it wasn't there. There wasn't any planning at a watershed scale. Also, with the start of the, the national forest systems with forest plans in the 1980s, we started to see the first large-scale planning of forests so that we now have forest stewardship plans for hundreds of thousands of acres where we can plan for all these issues like how much fire is tolerable, how much fire is not, and what do we do to prevent that high-intensity fire? How much water do we want to keep in the landscape? Where can we accommodate the need for grazing in the landscape? How do all these factors work together because too much grazing removes the fine fuels, the grasses and shrubs that we need for low-intensity fires across the landscape. 
if it's not humid enough in the forest, we have a greater risk that fire will explode into something that we can't control. So those are just small examples of how everything holds together. And if we don't uh, manage the landscape well, then that sponge that I was talking about, that is the soil, will again deplete and erode and cause sedimentation downstream that diminishes the productivity of farmland. So it is really important to start looking at how things hang together and figure out where it is possible to optimize the harvesting of water in the landscape. Harvesting of water, what do you mean by that? So that water that comes down through snow and rain doesn't rush down right away. Snow in open sun sublimates. That means it goes directly from a solid state in a gas state. So it's like the it's like evaporation but of snow. Yes, exactly. So and that is happening and studies throughout the world are now grappling with that problem of how can we keep more snow on the landscape? for the long-term water supply security in New Mexico, we need to really think about retaining more snow. So it's not just about how much precipitation we get, which is important and which is decreasing as the climate changes, but there's also a real difference between rain and snow. Absolutely. So we have this big problem that with climate change, we get in certain periods, in certain years, just less water. It's hotter, so more of that water evaporates. And when it falls, it falls more in the form of rain, so it rushes off more rapidly. And we have less snow, and that is more important for for actually the water that we use on the land for agriculture or even drinking water in certain communities. In northern New Mexico, even if an area has about 50% snow, 50% rain throughout the year, The really usable water comes from snow. We get 65 to 85 percent of our water through snow. So maybe the precipitation that we get is 50 percent rain, 50 percent snow, but a lot of the rain falls either in drizzles that evaporates right away or it falls in major storms that are so concentrated and pick up so much sediment that it is cost prohibitive to capture that all at once and purify it. So it is really important that we focus on snow retention because if it's well retained and melts relatively slowly, it generates a more steady flow of water over many months between February and April, May, so that communities, farms, ranchers can use that water much more beneficially. So I recently did a study for the Cimarron Watershed Alliance in northern New Mexico, where they got a Bureau of Reclamation grant for water conservation. One of their key questions in that was, how can we store more water in the forest, in the mountains? Now, climate change impacts research has shown that we are losing the snow component in our landscape. So there is a critical, urgent question, how do we hold more snow in our mountains? Well, other studies have shown that actually so much snow ends up on the top of the trees, never reaches the ground. So if actually that snow stays on top of the trees, it cannot infiltrate into the soil because the majority of that snow goes directly up in the air through evaporation. And so it is really important that we manage our forests so that more of that snow can hit the ground. Now, that is all very complex how you do that, but there are forestry techniques that lead us to get more snow on the ground. And studies from how areas that burned in a moderate manner show that with the residual trees, we get more shade on the ground. Residual trees? The trees that stay in the forest that have not been burned and removed due to fire. So they cast a shade pattern on the ground. And because the winter sun is so low, that casts actually a pretty long shadow. So that is actually very useful because then you can create openings in the forest that are optimally shaded. There, the temperature is 10 to 15 degrees lower. Overnight, it freezes, so there is very little water loss, a snow loss, right? You need to make the openings that you cut in the forest and also so small that the wind cannot have any grip on the snow. So if you combine those factors, then you can figure out how you actually harvest trees in the forest to create more small openings so that actually you optimize the amount of shade in the forest 
so that more snow can stay on the land, infiltrate very gently and gradually into the soil, and then trickle through shallow aquifers down the slope and down the mountain. The benefit of that also is that it all doesn't melt with the first warm day of 65 degrees in late February, March. Because now we have the problem that we have massive snow melt happening in just a couple of weeks' time in, between late February and March. So if we have snow that melts more gradually, has a lower, longer melt-out date, as it's called, then we can have snow that stays in the forest until April or May, like it was before. Not that we get as much snow as in the past, but we need to optimize that. So is this something that you all are actually doing? It's or beginning to happen, yes. So, um, And is it working? We don't know yet. The proof is in the pudding, and the pudding still needs to be eaten. Funding has been set aside now to start implementing forest treatments that would reduce fire risk in those high mountains and increase snow cover in the mountains. Just tell us a little bit more about these, what you call treatments. I mean, do these involve, are you talking about basically cutting down trees? Yes, it is proposed that on private land, so not in wilderness areas because there we cannot cut, but on private lands or in high elevation forests, that small openings are cut so that more snow can stay on the ground and that snow will more gradually melt. So small openings means cut down a few a certain, acres. A few acres, okay. Yes, in each patch. So those are patch cuts because you cannot really thin those forests because all these trees, especially at higher elevation, don't have very deep roots. They need each other to stabilize themselves. And there is much higher wind higher up. So you need to really create openings that are optimally sited and placed across the landscape so that the impact of wind is minimal and snow capture is optimized. To what extent is the kind of restoration that you're talking about compatible with a forest industry? In other words, can people make use of these trees and and sell the wood? And is that, I mean, it's always dangerous when you get industry involved because their goals may be really different from the goals of conservation, water harvesting, and restoration. Yeah, thank you for that. That's really important. Eventually, I think, and that is also part of the landscape scale planning, it is really important to start looking at the local economies. And so it's essential that over time, the harvesting is in balance with the utilization of the wood in a local economy, because there is in many places way too much wood to even leave it in the forest. And because we can use that material for the rebuilding of a local wood products manufacturing industry, we should gradually build that up again. And so utilization of that material, stimulating local jobs, improving infrastructure to get the logs down to the industries is really important. In New Mexico, we've largely lost our forest products industry in the last 30 years. And so building that back up needs to go step by step so that the landowners and public agencies that control the flow of wood from harvested operations in the forest forms a guarantee over multiple years for the supply of wood to investors that invest in these wood products industries. But also our roads are not strong enough for big logging trucks. We need to also start thinking about road improvement, electricity improvement. And then in many northern New Mexico communities, once these industries start picking up, we need to start looking at housing for people, schooling for people, services that make towns that are reinvigorated lively again. Because we have lost a lot of population in northern New Mexico. Taos County, Ria Riba, Colfax County have seen basically a decline of population or a standstill over the last 30 years. But again, let's say you build up an industry. I mean, these are private industries. How do you see to it that what they are doing is compatible with the goals of restoring landscape ecosystems? I think that needs to be done in a planned way so that you, with the communities and the counties, in ongoing dialogue, set the goals for 
economic parameters and economic growth, and that all the different elements are kept in check and in balance with each other. And that is a hard conversation because the open market system of the United States is not always conducive from a political perspective to such a very planned economy, but that is eventually the best way to do it. And that is my personal perspective on this, and that maybe has some historical European <laughs> right. I mean, when, background. When Americans hear planned economy, they think of communism and the kind of catastrophes of, of those economies. Yeah, and I think that is based on a lack of insight and knowledge about that there's a huge world of opportunities between strict top-down communist and socialist systems and a planned economy that a country like Germany has that is totally acceptable for many people in this country. Right, right. Let's talk about some of the success stories that you've had. One of them is beaver reintroduction. There are places where beavers have been reintroduced at first to the chagrin of residents, but then later, not so much. Yeah, so one example of that is that Santa Fe County asked me seven, eight years ago, uh, I was invited to help them think through a series of management plans for county open space properties. Uh, Santa Fe County has about 6,600 acres of open space, over 30 sites, and several are really jewels. And one of them is the Los Portreros uh, wetland open space uh, behind the Santuario de Chimayo. Those areas used to be a balance between wet meadows that originally were also used by the local population for certain forms of agriculture or turning out foals and and horses. Uh, Potrero means foal pasture. So upon studying that and making a management plan for that entire area, we saw that the riparian areas were drying out. Riparian areas are basically the riverside vegetation and that they were uh, drying out because the creeks were digging into the landscape, getting deeper and deeper. And that also led to problems for getting water in the acequias there locally. So there were some beavers there, but they were from time to time removed because there was a perception that those beavers were not helpful to the acequias, and they probably weren't. They sometimes clog them up and do all kind of shenanigans that increases maintenance, so that's not quite fun. But what we wanted to do is actually to bring the bottom of the river back up so that actually the river comes up a little higher so that it can overflow the land. The advantage of that is that you get more water stored in the wet meadows and that it doesn't rush down. Uh, You still have enough water flowing through so that it feeds all the acequias and you actually can create new habitat for all kind of wildlife and animals, plus feed those meadows where sometimes people might want to graze. So balance nature out in a way with all its processes that I've mentioned. So when you just, just to clarify, when you say raise up the river, the river has been incised too deeply. So Correct. the river is actually deeper than it naturally should be. Correct. And so in, in 2017, The county already worked on redoing all the diversion dams there so that they could hold more uh, water back and get more water into the acequias. But that was just not enough to also prevent the dying of all the cottonwoods and willows on the banks. And so we submitted a proposal to actually start restoring parts of the Rio Quemado. And that came at the same time that, for some reason... The beavers had a successful year, and they started to park right in the middle of our project area and felt like, huh, uh, maybe we want to help these guys. Well, a joke, of course, but you never know whether they have some inkling what we were doing. We were talking, of course, we had learned as a restoration community a lot about beavers. So there has been this popular term of building beaver dam analogs. We planned series of dams that were inspired by beaver dams, And uh, the beavers liked that well enough to start building right on top of them or in between them. And while our project was being implemented, certain areas were already totally flooded out by a beaver dam that was just built a month before that. And so we had to accommodate our plants quite a bit. But while we were building our stuff, the beavers were too. And in a period of two years, with our little dams and the beaver dams, the entire area started 
flooding and what was a small meadow of maybe a couple of acres of wetland now is a 100% wetland meadow. So much so that it starts moving to the higher grounds upstream. And what the nice thing is that what I heard from the local Asekia people is that they initially thought that the beavers were clogging their drains. And we put cameras up to show that they actually didn't. The second thing we saw is that between the winter runoff in February, March, and the summer rain starting in, in July, there is often a dry spell, that it's sometimes hard to get irrigation water. So it has to be brought in through a big ditch from the Santa Cruz River. And that's planting season. And that's planting season, exactly. But now with water stored in that wetland, there was a permanent flow of water in the river. And the Rio Camado didn't go dry three years in a row now, despite the droughts we've had. So that the Asequia owners now have had a permanent flow of water in their Asequias, probably thanks to what we did and especially what the beavers did. Did you see a change in attitude toward beavers from the people in the community? The beaver dams are still there. It took several meetings, and I must really credit the courage of the community to embrace this new concept of leaving the beaver dams alone. So people have seen maybe that it uh, was beneficial to them. So now the beaver dams are no longer destroyed. Uh, There are nine or ten beaver dams spread through five or six acres and also traveling upstream in the Rio Camado away from the acequias. So I haven't heard yet whether the beavers are messing with the acequias downstream. I hope that they're going all upstream where they do increasingly good work to hold water back in the landscape that actually will benefit the entire community. Do you see the cottonwood and willow trees growing back? Well, that is an ironic situation because beavers, of course, first consume a lot of that to build their dams. And yes, now that there is new light on these banks, that the banks have now a lot of water, uh, at the edges of these saturated areas, you see tons of new willows and cottonwoods coming back in. So the, the area is basically rejuvenating with this new change of, of water on the landscape. We've been talking a lot about things that are being done and that can be done in the future on a, on a large scale in sort of ecological terms and building soil and changing the way water flows and the way fire is. But of course, all of this is grounded in people. I mean, communities, farmers, ranchers, funding sources, state agencies, federal agencies, and all of these are embedded in culture and history. And working with all of this is just a huge people challenge. I mean, at least as challenging as landscape planning itself. And As you've been implying during this conversation, it has to be done, the people part, the landscape part, all of it has to be done in a kind of holistic way where you see that all the different pieces are interconnected with one another. Talk about that. Talk about how this holistic thinking works, what the challenges are, what you're facing. Hmm, Thank you for that question. That is wonderful. Uh, I think that it goes back to my initial observation when you talked about you. And I think... The landscape planning you, Jan Willem, are doing. (laughs) Plural plural you in in the sense of we. Yes, exactly. And so, because although my firm is really small, we are working with contractors and in partnerships. That is really the essence of how we work. And even if I work with the individual landowner, we're trying to bring that landowner in touch with a network or with neighbors in a watershed so that eventually a stewardship awareness is being cultivated among landowners that are part of a larger watershed where we work then with multiple groups and government agencies on multiple projects so that people start to see that even a management plan for water spreading on their private property is benefiting a neighborhood and through the neighborhood, a watershed and through the watershed, an entire bioregion. And that as a result of that, we're storing water at a landscape scale through multiple different connected properties. 
and, and streams and wetlands. And that through that, we're creating corridors for wildlife at a landscape scale to move during drought or fire or other upheavals for them. And that's really what is important. And then now back to the human component. So all the projects that I'm doing eventually, or in principle, have a multi-party collaborative component to it. So through the funding, through all the partners, the landowners, we're forming project teams that often work for decades in a specific area. Like in the Galisteo Basin and in central Santa Fe County, I've been working for more than two decades right now, 25 years really. In the Embudo Valley, I've been now for 15 years. And that is how I feel we need to work, stimulate each other, learn from each other, make each project a collaborative learning network that is one stepping stone in an entire series of projects that are strategically connected in time and across the landscape so that they form over two decades, three decades, a large strategy for bringing life and economy back to a specific region. This requires basically government funding to think in terms of decades rather than sort of two to four year cycles and political electoral cycles. Do you see that happening? Yeah, but it depends really on certain people outside the government agencies. So it depends on landowners, on watershed associations, on conservation, nonprofit groups, where there are people who have a visionary approach, who work and are committed to working in a landscape for decades. And when you work with ranchers that have formed a watershed association like the Hermit Speak Watershed Alliance or the Cimarron Watershed Alliance, that is obvious, the Chama Peak Land Alliance, all those groups are landowner-based. These people are there to stay. So then you naturally get a multi-decade approach to the work. Certain groups here in northern New Mexico, like Quivira, like the Forest Stewards Guild, also have a long view. They have been working for decades with public agencies to work together with all these agencies and between all these agencies. And now, in the last several years, these agencies have also found ways of having their collaborative networks. So there is a collaborative network of forest and watershed groups managed through the New Mexico Forestry Division. And the State Surface Water Quality Bureau has a wetlands program where they have wetlands roundtables where they bring various agency people together. And other agencies have their collaborative networks too. So all these collaborative networks are eventually helping each other because it's always the same people. And then you get a cross-pollination also among the agencies working together. And I, I think that there is really hope in the level of collaboration that I've seen developing over the last couple of decades in northern New Mexico. Now the next step needs to be done to work with community-based organizations to strengthen the ties at these institutional levels and at the community levels. And that's already happening too, but much more needs to happen there. I mean, one big piece that I wanted to talk to you about is job creation and workforce development. I mean, there's a lot of people in rural communities who need jobs. There's a lot of work to be done in forests, like just all the kind of things that you've been talking about that involve better management of forests to retain water and so on and lots more. There's also a lot of federal money right now. So it seems like this could be creating a lot of opportunity. What's actually happening? Is the money, I mean, the untold hundreds of millions, billions, whatever dollars from the federal government going into communities, going into job creation, going into restoration in an effective way? I think we're waiting to see that the answer. Uh, New Mexico, northern New Mexico particularly, has been blessed over the last several years with definitely a lot of money, like you said, uh, through the Forest Service particularly, but some other agencies as well. And so the state has definitely also s stepped forward with more money. There are new laws on the books since the last couple of years that allocate more funding to soils, water, wildlife, 
And that, that is really important because that money leverages federal funding for the future to come. And so that has set up the state and all the partners in the state that I just mentioned to work more together. Then also in the last year, uh, New Mexico Forestry Division and the Forest Service were required to work more together under the shared stewardship agreement between the states and the U.S. Forest Service. So that creates more collaboration. However, I think we are still waiting to see how all that money is being structured and organized through procedures for stimulating local economic development. And uh, I hope that we can see that happening in the next year. It is beginning, but it is still very much the beginning. And more collaboration needs to happen in dialogue with counties and with community-based organizations. And one of the big problems that I've experienced myself is that at the community level, at the county level and the individual community level, the institutional capacity of local nonprofits, of local leadership is just in numbers, not there. And we need many more local businesses. We need local collaborative working groups and partnerships that can organize themselves to be a point of contact in the community with the federal agencies. And, and that is the weak link uh, in my view right now. I mean, there's also a cultural piece. You have a kind of double colonization. First, uh, Native people were colonized by the Spanish, and then the descendants of those Spanish people were colonized by the Americans, and there's cultural resistance. I mean, I've heard people say, oh, yeah, they just want to come and tell you what to do, you know? And so how, like, that's mm. that must be a piece that has to be overcome. Thank you for that. Yes, absolutely. There, there is an entire layer of history and language and cultural differences that we need to reconcile. And what runs through all this is trust and respect because we culturally from each of our background have different histories of values and different interpretations of history. We need to really listen to each other at the local community level to understand what is important for each other so that in that listening to each other, we can come together and recognize and acknowledge the hardship certain segments of the local communities have gone through or are still in or reliving. And what they need now, what they want, what, what story they want to tell because they have not been able to or allowed to have their voices heard in a more formal context in relation to land values. And absolutely, that is important. And the structures for that to happen are limited. So we need to also create more time and forums in which that can take place and come to each other in ways that we can build trust. What are some of the ways of engaging local communities that you are working on, that you have seen, you know, like workshops, educational opportunities, working with youth, things like that. Great. Thank you for that, too. It's an important piece, I think, in our work and in doing this management planning work collaboratively is to create local action teams. Nowadays, we call them core teams. Those are teams of landowners, of community representatives, of agency people that we bring together in the planning process for, say, a watershed plan or a wetlands plan or a community wildfire protection plan, so that different segments of a community, of a county, of a planning area are represented in the planning process. I must immediately say and admit to those who raise some eyebrows with what I'm saying that that process is not ideal in the sense that I've seen that we don't necessarily get equal and representative participation of all the segments of the community. And that is definitely problematic and more work needs to be done over time to figure out how we can get better participation. And I just want to jump in and say, I mean, what we're talking about is restoring land in a way that benefits those communities themselves. Absolutely. In terms of both having enough water and having jobs. And having savings, because so many communities 
And I say with mean with savings, saving of stewardship, maintenance, and repair work. Because so many communities are now dealing with spending thousands, tens of thousands of dollars every year digging out acequias, cleaning off roads, digging sediment out of fields, replanting trees because they were smothered or eroded away, and so on and so on. Fire, flooding in the community, rebuilding homes, and so on. So it's like preventive of those things. Preventing that. Just the infrastructural and home damage of a fire like the Hermit's Peak Canyon Fire runs into billions. But a small flooding event like in Dixon or Alcalde last year or the year before runs into hundreds of thousands of dollars too. And that is all labor, time, efforts, materials that could have used otherwise if the surrounding environment were more stable. And now there is a redistribution of water in many northern New Mexico communities because this early summer didn't provide the water. So if those mountains could actually soak up more water and more gently provide that water, then maybe the redistribution of water could have been postponed or averted altogether. And so there are also communities that are downstream from healthier areas. They know that because, for instance, they haven't burned or these forests have been restored. They don't have that problem. And so in the face of these daunting problems of climate change and the historic degradation of our land, it can be daunting to even start thinking about that. But many people who are in this field right now have some hope in a fighting chance that with collaborative planning and planning at a landscape scale, we can reverse some of those things over years and over decades. And that means then that from the get-go, we have to work with the local communities. We have to figure out how we start dialogues in the community so that people start to see that certain forms of land use are causing problems for themselves, that running off-road vehicles in upland areas causes the erosion and the flash flooding. And that is a very difficult concept to grasp. But I hope that with field tours at our demonstration projects, with community meetings, slideshows, hands-on workshops where people build the structures themselves and are taught how to do it so they can also do it in their backyards, that gradually people start to see, like, oh, wow, there is maybe something in it for me or for our neighborhood, our family, our street. They begin to see that, I think, more with the larger problems, like fire. More and more people really see how to treat the land to prevent fire. And I think it is gradually, in some communities breaking through, that they all start to see how erosion or soil health are issues that are to their benefit, or preventing erosion, that is, and, and building soil health. And that means having maybe some managed grazing patterns, having designated areas for your off-road vehicles, or times of the year that you should not use them in certain areas at all. And so if we come up collectively, gradually, by listening to each other, understanding where we all are coming from, and probably then figuring out that we largely have common goals figuring then out strategies, how to meet the common goals. And I think, I mean, grazing is an important thing to just at least mention because overgrazing has been part of the problem, but there are ways to do grazing on that exact same land that's been overgrazed that is healthy for the land. That's right. And that means often in the beginning, after we have admitted that degradation has happened, that we need to hold back and find alternative grazing grounds for livestock and then start a managed grazing program so that actually through the grazing, we're stimulating healthy growth of the grass and more densely crop grass growth and, and root development and soil development again and identifying where and what times of the year we should not have animals in certain places like wetlands and riparian areas. Specifically in the growing season, we should not have them there because then we're basically breaking down what we're trying to build up actually with the use of those animals, because it can be done. There are now enough examples and even scientific studies that show how grazers in a managed way can stimulate and improve herbaceous cover, cover by grass and flowering plants. 
Many people who are listening have probably heard the concept of the triple bottom line, uh, people, planets, profit. This is a way that many people are starting to think about doing business. There's also now a fourth piece. Tell us about that. Oh, wonderful. So we discovered through work on healthy soils in New Mexico uh, that there is a great need to bring the healthy soil program in New Mexico also to a landscape scale. And by pioneering a project at various sites with New Mexico Healthy Soils, we're looking at this integrated landscape scale restoration approach and have looked beyond our borders of the United States to how that's being done in other countries. And one of the agencies or foundations that's working on that is the Common Land Foundation or Common Lands Group in the Netherlands. In fact, that's only a few Dutch people. There are many people from Australia, New Zealand, all over the world working in that organization. And they work at oh, more than a dozen landscapes and countries uh, throughout the world and have discovered that besides the ecological or environmental results that you want in a landscape, you also want socioeconomic returns and financial returns. That's the triple bottom line. And then they saw that eventually to stimulate people, encourage them to be part of, of this through adversity and to get financial supporters, you need actually inspiration. You need motivation. And so that became their fourth point in the quadruple bottom line. To people, actually planet, profit, inspiration. Inspiration, exactly. So that through inspiration, events that make people laugh and smile and celebrate. We bring an other way of learning and coming together socially and inspiring, again, financiers or agencies at an intuitive level to join, not only at the rational levels of the first triple bottom line. And really, if you look how a lot of people make decisions, inspiration is a very important part of it. So creating excitement but not in an advertising way, but in a genuine, authentic way that builds social relationships and trust and respect. That's the inspirational part of that quadruple bottom line. I think one of the things that's striking about this kind of new way of working, and you talked about being embedded in networks and networks within networks, in a funny way, it sounds to me like you're not taking a top-down approach. You're taking this kind of everybody learning from each other, everybody listening to each other approach. And I don't know, it seems to me that's kind of like the way nature itself works. There's no central authority exactly. It's Is that true? That's exactly a great summary of the vision that I have for the kind of work that we're doing. So that it is actually a very broad, flat, organizational system where we all are spark plugs for each other to do the right thing and do research and experimentation, try to involve each other as partners rather than in a hierarchical setting. And so I see myself more as a spider in a web pulling at different strings of that web to stimulate others to get money in, to identify the right place for doing projects so that it fits in between other projects, connects these projects uh, through learning networks, but also across the landscape for wildlife and water and soil health. And then eventually the communities uh, get in touch with each other and start learning so that we see that people from Taos learn about what's happening in Dixon or that in Dixon they heard what happened in Galisteo. So that across northern New Mexico, people start cross-fertilizing ideas. And I think that is the richness that we need to have. And that's already happening, actually, where we start working across boundaries with native people, with Hispanic communities, with communities that are maybe more Anglo-dominated, with government agencies, and then especially young people. We need to get many more young people to have hope that there is jobs, opportunity in northern New Mexico. And so working with schools, stimulating all these youth crews that are gradually growing in northern New Mexico. There are multiple youth conservation corps crews and other crews all throughout that are participating in this work. And that is so rich and hope-giving. 
Yeah, I was going to say, I mean, this summer, I mean, we're recording this in the middle of an unbelievable heat wave. And we hear stories of oceans that are warmer than hot tubs and things like that. Do you feel hopeful? You see, I, Mary Charlotte, I feel hopeful because I think I apply myself and I see others who apply themselves. If you start taking on all the problems in the world, you're overwhelmed and have to cower back in a little corner. And that is not natural either, right? Because it's nowadays, thanks to social media and other media, that we seem to know everything from all the corners of the world. But you also need to realize that most media only make money from the disastrous things. Good news is not coming into the mainstream media like interviews like this and all the other ones that you do as all the bad news that there is. And so besides pranks, YouTube is full with all bad news if you really start looking at what's being thrown at you. And so I think that if you start looking what you actually can do as an individual together with your social environment and start building that social environment and professional environment and then making the links and connections and stay in a place for decades, you can make a difference. And there is money to be made too. And this is a call out to everybody. Because I came here as an immigrant people, I came with nothing other than that I had some knowledge and some connections. And gradually, I applied myself, committed to Northern New Mexico, and do a ton of work now through all kind of organizations. And I'm still learning. I make a lot of mistakes, I'm sure. But I hope that I've built connections too, and I think I do, so that actually a lot of this work that I'm talking about is being done and not over the backs of people, but with people, hand in hand, building it all up together, giving hope, trust, respect to everybody who participates. Jan Willem Janssens, thank you so much for being with us on Down to Earth. You're very welcome, Mary Charlotte, and thank you for doing these talks. They're hope-giving. And you can find out more about Jan Willem's work at ecotonelandscapeplanning.com. Save the date for Regenerate 2023. This conference will be held in Santa Fe, New Mexico, November 1st through 3rd. Regenerate 2023 will explore regenerative agriculture at every scale, from microbial soil communities to social relationships and markets to our changing climate and everything in between. Come learn how people from all walks of life are innovating on the land, in the markets, and with their communities to bring greater diversity and resilience to this movement. Registration will open in June. Check out the website for more information at regenerateconference.com. You've been listening to Down to Earth. We would love it if you would support this program, which you can do by going to patreon.com slash downtoearthplanettoplate, where you can sign up for as little as $3. Patreon is P-A-T-R-E-O-N. And also please rate and review the podcast on Apple Podcasts or wherever you get your podcasts. The Kivira Coalition is a not-for-profit and a community network of ranchers, farmers, conservationists, scientists, educators, and many others dedicated to regenerative practices that produce healthy food, support meaningful livelihoods, sustain biodiversity, and remedy the impacts of climate change. To learn more about Kivira and how you can support their work, visit kiviracoalition.org, Q-U-I-V-I-R-A. And finally, this show is a production with the Radio Cafe. You can check out radiocafe.org to hear back episodes of this show and also find all kinds of other shows on a wide variety of topics as well. Thanks for listening, and we'll see you next time.